Today I want to just kind of repeat quickly what I mentioned and what we've talked about last week about anonymous intruder. How Satan likes to attack people and he manipulates people that when people come for help to him, they don't really get help, they just get more demons with different names. And last week we talked about the idea that our God is a good God and everything he does is very good. And the devil is a bad devil and everything he does is really bad. But one of the characteristics that Satan has is a characteristics of always being anonymous in our life. He wants to, in the life of a Christian, to do mess and for the Christian never to know that the devil was there. Because then the Christian will be tempted to blame God for the troubles that he's facing. This is the devil's plan for you. Take credit for the good things that happen to you. Blame God for the bad things that happen to you. And always leave him out of the picture. He wants you to take credit for the good. Blame God for the bad and leave him out of the picture. To think of him that he's on a vacation. He is chillaxing. But for most of us as Christians, we know God is not guilty. We are not worthy. And the devil is not innocent. Can somebody say amen? God is not guilty. He's not responsible for the problems. We are not responsible for the good things. That's the grace of God. And the devil, he is not innocent. He has his fingerprints over every pain and trouble that people face on this world. Can somebody say amen? We don't shift blame on the devil, but we sure don't let him go off the hook. Okay. Amen. And so that's what we talked about last week. And it's important that we keep that in mind. The Bible talks about Satan. Pastor already mentioned after worship that he is a thief. And if you know anything about a thief or if God forbid you were a thief, you know one thing about a thief, a success of a thief is being able to take something without somebody pointing it to you. Correct? When they point it to you or they find you, you're not a successful thief. You become a criminal and you go to jail. I remember uh, when we had uh, our youth group account, uh, money account, long time ago. Uh, and so we gathered 126 or $24. It was a long time ago. It was right in that office. And we were not wise. We were not educated. And so what we did is we left the money there in the office. And, uh, and we had one uh, thief amongst us who was part of us, kind of like Judas. And he came and he sold us a DVD to our youth group. He sold us a DVD. We found out that DVD he sold us, he stole from somebody. Then we had to return the DVD because we found out later. And the $124 went missing. And it's not because the money had rapture. It's because the money had a visitor. And we did not know who it was. Until we noticed that our homeboy, we were all, you know, teenagers. So we were pretty broke. And he started to wear brand new pants, brand new, like all the new clothes. He was not a wise thief. You know, you don't want to wear same, if you stole money, you don't want to buy things on the same week. And so he bought them on the same week. And we started to notice that he's dressing up, taking everybody to Starbucks and just feeding everybody. And we started to kind of ask around if his parents gave him money, if he worked anywhere, they said no. And then uh, we found out quickly that it was our brother who had his hands involved in the $124 missing from our youth account. And he was not successful thief. In our church, we had a camera stolen. We have three cameras. We had three cameras and one camera disappeared. And I can assure you, till this day, we do not know who took it. It's gonna be my probably first question in heaven when I'm going to show up. Literally almost every person who gets delivered in our church, from our church, and after they get delivered, I said, okay, you've done a lot of sins. Can you tell me, please, did you take the camera? <laughs> I remember I asked our cousin David. I asked a lot of other people who got delivered. I said, okay, we're not going to judge you. We know the demon was behind it, but I need to know, for my consciousness sake, did you take the camera? Because it bothers me, the fact that it was taken, and I know it's not somewhere laying. It's most likely been sold four times, somebody made money on it. Because when something is missing, it's not really missing. Somebody took it, sold it on Greg's list, and made a lot of money off of it. 
And that's what the characteristic of the devil. He wants to take something and he never wants to leave a trace in such a way that you cannot connect. That something is missing is connected to him. That is his characteristic. He likes to remain anonymous. That's why he hates when people get delivered from demons. Because when the demon speaks out in the presence of the fire of God, the person gets free from a demon. But the Christians, us, we get free from ignorance. A light goes on in our mind. Boom. Ah. This person is saying they don't have affection in their marriage. And the devil says he's behind it. And you're looking maybe in your marriage or you know somebody who has a marriage and has no affection at all. Not just, you know, that things are challenging or conflicts, but literally no affections. And you're tempted with something else. And you're like, oh, I know who's behind this. The devil is a liar. And he's a thief. Amen. And so that is why it's so important for us to see testimonies, to hear deliverances, to read the Bible. We mentioned last week that Satan sometimes uses a cult and through witchcraft and through all kinds of horoscopes, through talking to the dead people, through visiting the cemetery, through um, dream catchers, through all kinds of other participations, Satan slips into our life. We mentioned last week also that through nightmares, many times the devil comes in and he can torment people's lives through nightmares. When nightmares happen to people and people get tormented. We know that as dreams, dreams come from three sources. They come from God, they could come from you, and they can come from the devil. A lot of people become very obsessed with their dreams. Like some people feel like if a dream came to pass, that's, this means God spoke to me. And it's very important not to get fooled by the devil to become obsessed with your dreams that you remove the value of the Word of God in your life. Yeah. When a dream comes to pass once and twice and third time, that does not mean you should start a non-profit prophetic ministry. That doesn't make you a prophet because sometimes the fifth dream could come of something bad and you will begin to be tempted to not know, okay, Four dreams came to pass, they must be from God and this dream must be from God and you will live your life confused. It's important to hear God speak through His Word and by His Spirit and not to let our life be driven away 100% by dreams. Can somebody say amen? This week I met a, a young lady whose boyfriend died a month ago and she said that she asked God to speak to her so she will see that boyfriend in a dream and so that that boyfriend will tell her that he went to heaven. And I was like, and what, what happened? She's like, yeah, he came to me and I know he went to heaven. And I was like, based on what? That I had a dream, he went to heaven. I was like, can you imagine? You're playing games with fire. I'm like, what if he comes tomorrow and says he went to hell? He said, I will be devastated. I'm like, where did you find in the Bible that you should place your trust on the fact that in the dream he said to you he went to heaven? Your foundation is a nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. If he placed his trust in the blood of Jesus, the seal is over, the deal is over. But I want to know whether he went to heaven. The blood says a person goes to heaven when they put their trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? And so it's important that we remain very not too open-minded concerning our dreams where we put our trust in the Word of God and the prom promises of the Word of God. Can somebody say amen? amen? We also mentioned last week that it's important to understand that through pornography, demons enter. Many times demons enter a person's life through pornography or all kinds of sexual perversions. When a person begins to watch pornography, we must understand that pornography is something that is the worst part about pornography, along with many other perils, is that it creates within you an appetite that could never be satisfied. It's an athlete's food. The more you scratch it, the more it itches. And then you want more harder pornography, harder pornography, harder pornography, until you start wanting that kind of pornography where people from the outside will look at you and they say, you are crazy. And that's exactly what happens to people. They go crazy. And when they get married, even when they are Christians, they could never be happy with a marital sexual relationship because in pornography you're taught to always pervert things and to go harder and harder and harder and you will never be happy and then the opposite at the end you can actually become a person whom they can lock up in a mental institution. Pornography is not just naked girls. Pornography has a demon behind it. Many people will say, but God made people naked. 
Have you noticed that the, before they get any children, God clothed them? And in heaven, there's going to be no naked glorified bodies. Everybody's going to have their clothes on. So the next thing you use the whole idea, God made everybody naked. So God wants me to enjoy the devil is a liar. And he lied to us and he lies to our generation to say that lie. He stands behind that perversion and he wants to corrupt you, wash down your boundaries and eventually create within you an appetite that even pornography will never ever satisfy. There's going to be not enough pornography in the world, not enough hard pornography to ever satisfy an urge inside. That urge, the Bible says, must be nailed on the cross and so you can enjoy your life for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? And that demon needs to be kicked out of our life so that we can live freely. And when you get married, enjoy sex for the glory of God. Amen. We also, last week, mentioned that when we disobey and dishonor our parents, the enemy can slip in. When we hold on to unforgiveness, the enemy can slip in. If you have your Bible, I want to read that verse one more time that I read last week. And just continue, mention a few more thoughts before we go to prayer. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 30 says the following, let both grow together until the harvest and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. This is the same parable that I was talking to you last week about. This is the second parable Jesus shared in Matthew chapter 13. And the parable goes like this. A good man sowed a good seed. While they slept, a bad man, an enemy came, sowed bad seed. And then they asked the question, who sowed the bad seed? The master said, the enemy sowed the bad seed. And next thing that happened is they asked, what should we do? Should we go and pluck things out? And he said, no, wait. He said, let things grow a little bit. And then he says, at the harvest time, I am going to send the reapers. And they will go and gather up the tares. And they will gather them up in the bundle and throw them in the fire. And then I'm going to tell them to gather the wheat and put it into my barn. Now, the, usually the practical application of this parable is that in this world, there are people who don't believe in Jesus and there are people who do believe in Jesus. And at the end of age, what's going to happen is people who don't believe in Jesus, that they will go into hellfire. Not because they are worse than other people, but because their sins were not covered by the blood of Jesus. And the Christians, people who believe in Jesus as their Savior, they will go into God's barn, means into heaven, into God's place. But today I want to look at this scripture not to twist it or take something out of a context, but I just want to simply bring something that will apply to you today. Not when you die, not when the end of the world is going to happen, but something that you can apply today. The tares represent anything the devil does in our lives. The wheat represents things that God wants to do in our life. The soil is you. And the Lord says, number one, let's gather up all the tares and throw them in the fire. So we see fire destroys the tares. Let's take the wheat and let's put it into my barn. And barn represents a community of believers which we call the church. A barn represents a home group. A barn represents where you are in a community, you're gathered together in the assembly of saints. And in that barn, we can use our logic. You, the grain is not just stored there, for a show, a grain eventually is removed and placed on the threshing floor where it's unfortunately gets a little bit beaten and the chaff around the grain falls off and so the grain remains alone. They take that grain, grind it out and the grain gets turned into flour and then the flour gets made into a bread and a lot of hungry people have bread. So this is God's process. Remove the tares, throw them in the fire. Put the weed into the barn and take the weed and make it into a bread. I want to simply share with you from this verse three, most, three important factors in your life. The one factor that we already just mentioned 
is the fire factor. The fire factor. There is mainly two fires in this world. There is a fire that's waiting everybody who doesn't know the first fire. The last fire is the hell fire. And the first fire is the holy fire. The holy fire is the fire I pray you and I encounter every day. The holy fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit. This fire takes our worst, our ugliness, our evil, and it burns it. This fire is not intimidated by no demon, no sickness, no diagnosis, no weakness, or the length it prolonged in your life. This fire, like a natural fire, is not afraid of a bush. So is the holy fire of God is not afraid of anything the enemy has to bring. It actually thrives on it. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. To have real freedom in life, you must know the person of the Holy Spirit. There is no freedom. Tears cannot be removed from the soil of my heart without the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person but Holy Spirit also has power and his power in the scriptures is symbolized in the form of a fire. He is a person that can be known and talked to and fellowshiped with but his fire is what he has and when his fire begins to touch your issues, your issues churn to ashes. Your issues, they churn to powder. They churn to nothing and they get completely and wiped out. Jesus said that he casts out demons through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you want to live free life, you must understand you have to get to know the person of the Holy Spirit and welcome the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. There is a human effort involved here. Before the fire came, if I could say like that, or before things were thrown into the fire, the servants whom Jesus calls in this parable reapers did their job. They gathered all of the wheat, all of the tares, excuse me. They gathered all of the things that needed to be destroyed. They plucked them out one by one, gathered them in a bundle and then threw them into the fire. The issue sometimes exists when it comes to deliverance or when it comes to freedom is that many times instead of plucking the demonic activities out of our life, we take a jar with water and go water it and sit on the sidelines and ask God to send the fire to burn what we water. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a part that we have to play before Holy Spirit's fire touches an issue in your life, you have to prepare for it. You need to do your part of you plucking things out and you're coming to an end of your effort so that you can come to the beginning of his anointing. God's anointing doesn't just come on the place that did not do their part and their work. Many times people have an addiction or they have a certain thing that is hindering their Christian life. And they develop after a while an apathy. They develop a complacency and a lethargic attitude toward God. And this is the attitude they have. I will go to the prayer line and get delivered. But until the prayer line, I can't overcome it. I will go to the Skoen and there I will get completely delivered. But until Skoen, I can't overcome it. So I am not going to do nothing about it. I want God's fire to come and burn my field. But God's fire is waiting for you to do the groundwork and pre present it. So when His fire comes, God will add his super to your natural to make it supernatural but God will not add super if there is no natural 
there has to be a natural effort placed a hunger and a desire for God to put his mark and mark that effort by his fire and by his blessing the Bible even says God will bless the work of our hands if we don't work with our hands God has nothing to bless Jesus allowed disciples to ask them do you guys have anything that I can touch they said we don't have much but we have two loaves and two fish Jesus could have said well that's not enough let me make bread out of a cloud because what you have is not enough anyway no Jesus says bring everything you have and when you bring everything you have I am going to add what I have and then we both are going to have a miracle you want to have a miracle in your life Jesus is asking bring me everything you got you want to be free from pornography Jesus says bring me everything you got oh no Lord but you deliver me and then I'm gonna serve you Jesus says no you bring every effort your desire everything you can squeeze out of yourself you bring that to me and I am gonna touch what you have which is not enough but when I touch it I will add my super to your natural and then you will have a supernatural miracle can somebody say amen when Elijah was on the mountain the Bible says that he waited for God's fire to come but this is what Elijah said Lord I have done everything according to your word and then fire came many of us we come to God and we say God I did nothing according to your word let your fire come so I can start doing something but that's not how fire comes I remember when being a teenager when I was exposed to pornography and about 14 years ago when I struggled with pornography and when I say struggled I mean struggled most people when they say they struggle with pornography they mean they indulge in pornography there's a difference between struggling and indulging struggling is when you're fighting indulging is when you're indulging and I struggled with it because I knew it was a sin and my consciousness killed me and the first thing that I remember I had to do is go and tell the person who I was scared to tell to it was my pastor it would have been better for me in that day instead of going telling my pastor that I fell into sin as a 15 or 16 year old teenager it would have been better to physically die I knew that probably going to him is he's not going to take away my problem but something had to done something had to be done God could not deliver me until I would tell him I have done everything in my power until Bob Larson prayed for me Benny Hinn prayed for me I prayed for me and my pastor prayed for me and then I said Lord I'm done and God says okay now I will begin that's why I pushed prayer and fasting that's why I pushed all of these things why because I recognized one thing I could not wait for God because maybe God was waiting for me God's fire comes when there is some work that's done within us and we show to him we are genuinely interested for you to move in our lives you want to see difference in your dreams I will ask you a question what would happen if you will stop watching movies before you go to sleep but read the scripture don't tell me that I want God to move but you did not make a room for him to move even Jesus refused to come on earth without sending John the Baptist to prepare the way God's fire is not going to come until you prepare your way until you bring your natural and God says let me add my super to it until you bring your five loaves and two fish and Jesus says yes I know that's all you have and honestly that's enough for me because if I add my fire to what you have my fire is gonna do a miracle in your life but don't expect God to come in and you will have your tacos somewhere in your bag don't expect God to bless what you do not give it to him everything you have pull it out of you and say God that's all I have and I depend on your mercy and if your mercy doesn't show up this is not going to be enough but with your mercy it's going to be more than enough can somebody say hallelujah <laughs> give God all that you have and he will touch it with this fire he will touch it with this fire and you will see people in Scowen who get delivered they don't get delivered an accident 
I remember I was talking to my cousin Martin, who is a disciple in the Scone, and he told me that he had to prepare for months for his deliverance. I was like, what do you mean? I was like, my definition of preparing for deliverance is committing more sin. The more sin you do, the more you're ready for the really for deliverance. Because that's what it's kind of like for fasting. You know, how do you prepare for fasting? You eat more. <laughs> that's how you prepare for deliverance. I mean, the way you prepare to deliverance, you really go get those sins deep and down. And he says, No, prophet, send me on three day dry fasting. Just no water and no food, three days to prepare for deliverance. And then I came to him and I said, man of God, pray, can I go in so that I can receive prayer and maybe receive deliverance? Not ready. Uh-huh. So deliverance doesn't just come because you sign up for a prayer line. Deliverance comes when you put all of your bundles together and then the fire comes. And if you accept to hide your little bread in one pocket and your fish in the other and say, Jesus, I don't have anything. Can you give me something? You might not get anything from Jesus. Maybe what you have is not enough, but it's enough with God's touch. But if you are not going to give God what you have, God cannot touch it. Can somebody say amen? amen? And after this touch, he takes, he goes, the next thing is we see the fire, but we also see the barn. The barn. Or they take the weed and they break the weed so that the chaff will be broken and so that the grain will be grinded out for making of bread. It's important to recognize that many people that Jesus delivered from demons, they were never discipled by him. Though they were delivered through him, they didn't submit themselves to be discipled by him. And eventually those people, their names you don't know. Do you know the name of a person who was deaf and mute, who was delivered from the demon? We don't. Do we know the name of the person who was, had a little boy who had epilepsy and moonstruck, the Bible says? When Jesus came from the mountain, we don't know him. Such a powerful deliverance. We only know um, one Mary who had eight demons and then she followed Jesus. Because a lot of these people, they experienced the fire of God on them. But they never took the good part of them and submitted to the barn. Because we live in a generation of me, myself and I. We live in a generation where we love our own space and we love nobody to tackle and mess with my grain. Because well, it's my grain, it's my life and I'm going to do whatever I want with it. Many times that is the problem. And because that grain, the good part, see the bad needs to be burned, the good needs to be broken. The good needs to be broken. Not only the bad, but also the good that you have needs to go into a barn and in that barn things need to be shifted and things need to be broken inside of you. I, I was reading a story of Hagar and Hagar was an Egyptian slave. She was a slave and she was also a servant to um, Sarah and to Abraham. And one day the Bible says when she became pregnant and she started to despise her, her mistress, her, her boss, Sarah. And she started to look on her down with despisement because, well, she got a baby inside. And not only she got a baby inside, she also, her head started to swollen. Because some people, you give them this much success and they give you attitude. Because when nothing is good with them, they, they're quiet, they're down. But when things begin to just go like this, people immediately, everything just, they just become so arrogant. They don't need the church. They don't need this. They don't need that. It's, they're only with God when things are bad. And they leave God when things are really good. And that's what, exactly what happened to Hagar. She developed an attitude. She became proud. She became arrogant. She forgot. If it wouldn't be for Sarah, she would never have a child. If, she wouldn't, be, if it wouldn't be for Sarah, she forgot that her baby here, Sarah had everything to do with it. That Sarah had a part in it. And instead of recognizing it, she just went and threw an attitude. So she decided to run and leave. Because she's like, I don't need Sarah and I don't need those people to look at me funny. And so she left and the angel of God meets her in the wilderness and the angel said this to her. He said, what you're carrying is huge. It's going to be mighty nations, mighty nations. But in this wilderness, what you're carrying is going to die. You have to go back to where you came from 
that woman that you think she has attitude you have to go back and submit yourself to her and dock that community of people who worship Jehovah submit yourself to that community and only there that which you carry can be birthed and that could be raised and at the right time you will be released from that environment to go do what you think you should do and Hagar humbled herself went in and she found Sarah and says Sarah I'm sorry she found Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm sorry. She grew there. The child was born and the child became great. I want you to notice, not only you need Holy Spirit, you also need a mentor and a community to grow. A mentor and a community to grow. You need a coach. If you don't have a coach, your gift will remain a grain. It will never be developed. It will remain as it is because you never had somebody who will pull it out of you and stretch you and push you and literally sometimes challenge you and correct you and give you opportunity for that gift to develop. Without a coach, you remain a grain. If you're getting married, you need a coach. You need a family that's been married more than you so they can challenge and they can encourage and they can guide you. Without a coach, you might be free but you will never be fulfilled and you will not be effective for the kingdom of God. Can somebody say amen? amen? You need a coach and you need a community of believers. A coach comes into your life and a coach does two main things. He compliments and he corrects. And if you have a lot of pride, his correction will make you suffer. The more pride you have, the more painful will be for you to be discipled. The less pride you have, the easier it will be for you to be discipled. A coach is sent into your life to speak life into you when you don't believe it. And you have to believe when he compliments you and you have to believe when he corrects you. I didn't believe I could be a great preacher. I still doubt that till this day. My pastor, he encourages me. He doesn't give me too much encouragement so it doesn't get into my head. But he encourages me just enough when I think that the service went so bad that I want to ask Jesus to take me to heaven the next day. And the pastor calls and he would say things like, and I know when he's not flattering, he would say things like, you know, you are the best preacher in this town. And I'm literally, sometimes I would pull my phone and I would just laugh because I'm like, that, that's, just, that's, just, ah, that's just not true. <laughs> but you know, when somebody says that a lot to you, you kind of start to believe that. And you might not agree with that, it's completely fine. But my pastor, when I was younger, 13 years of age, driving in the van with him, he would do completely construction. He would turn to me and he said, you are going to preach. You are going to be a powerful preacher. You guys will do crusades. And I remember listening. I never wanted to tell him that I'm not going to do it because he was older than me. I was afraid of him. And I, I just did not want it to get crushed. And so I just like, I just shut up. I was like, okay, okay. Other people never paid attention to those compliments. I took those compliments seriously. And honestly today, I can boldly say, I am not preaching today because I am eager to preach. I am preaching today because I am submitted to a barn. And I have a person who breaks my chaff on a regular basis. My insecurity, my fears, my feeling that says I am not going to make it, nothing is going to happen. And he breaks it off and says, you know what? This grain can be grain and this grain can be great. If you let this grain to be broken into the way God wants it to be broken. If the best basketball players in the world have coaches. Jesus needed a father to mature and to take care of him. You are not even Jesus and you think you don't need that. You need a coach. You may have degrees more than thermometer, but you still need a coach. You may read every book on love, but you still need a coach. Maybe you feel like you have a gift to speak. You need a coach in your life. Your coach may be younger than you. Your coach may be not the same race as you, but you have to submit yourself to your coach. In that form, your pride is going to die and your destiny is going to thrive. When your pride will thrive, your future will die. 
When you live in the wilderness, Isaac will die. When you submit yourself consistently to a community of believers, not showing up on church when we have a prayer line and just to see the power of God, not showing up in church and say, when is the wise man coming? Or when is T.B. Joshua coming? I will be there for sure. But I'm talking about consistently coming every single service. Do you know the difference between our leaders and everybody else who comes to church? Do you know why they speak the way they speak? The way they have influence, the way they have influence? Because number one, they have submitted themselves to this community in consistency. Something happens to your character when you choose consistency in a community. Community causes you to deal with your issues because sooner or later one or the other of us is gonna punch your pride and your pride like a balloon will deflate and you will have a reason like Hagar to run for your life and say these people are crazy. As crazy as the other church I ran to and as crazy as the other church I ran to. I have a calling in my life. I run from things when they get challenging. That's not how your character will get developed. Your character gets developed when you stick through one place and you stick it in consistency and that's when a grain breaks and that's when the destiny gets developed. Can somebody say amen? amen? It also happens when you have a coach. Not only community, but you have a coach. You have a cell leader. You have a pastor. A person who can speak into your life and a person who can say, our service starts at 10. For you, it starts at 9. And you're coming here at 10.30. Not again. You're like, yes, sir. Not, how dare she talk to me like that? I've been only coming here for three months. Does she know who I am? Does she know who, what I've been? Does she know how many scriptures I know? <laughs> that, that, does he know who I am? I should not be talked like that. I am offended in this church. And see, when you have that kind of attitude, guess what's going to happen? You are not going to grow. Period. You are going to remain grain. You will never become bread. You will not feed other people. You will live your life only about you. Now, when people compliment you, never don't let it get into your head. So then when they criticize you, it doesn't have to get into your heart. The people who, during compliments, their day gets better are the people, during criticisms, their day gets worse. And this is the secret I've discovered. When a pastor compliments you, don't get it into your head. Because the same pastor will eventually give you a correction and you are going to look for depression pills. Because you're going to say, this is so hard, this is so difficult. Why? Because you have to be a flexible person. You don't focus on that, you let it grow you. Let compliments grow your spirit and let correction grow your maturity and your character. Don't be so easily offended that people have to walk on eggshells to come approach you. Be a person that, when it's a compliment, thank you. But it is not going to go into this. And with, when it's a correction, thank you also for the feedback. It will not go here. I will survive through this for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? amen? When you go through the barn, God does something. He breaks your grain and he makes it into a flower. And then he makes the flower into a bread. Jesus came on earth as grain. But he became bread. How did he become bread? Not created bread. He became bread because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave the grain and said, Father, I want you to make salvation for the whole world out of my submission to your will. He died. It seemed like it's over. But one thing I loved about my God is anything you sacrifice to him, you will always get much more of the same in a better quality. Jesus came back three days later, except now he walked through the walls, except now he was in a completely glorified body. When you give something to God, it will come back to you, not right away. There will be those three day period where everything will go crazy. And you're like, I lost everything. I'm not getting anything. This is not working. This is so hard. The devil will bombard your mind like crazy. But if you stick around through those three days, three months, or God forbid, three years, your resurrection day is going to come. And that which you sacrificed, you will have so much of it. For those of you who are single, and you decided in, in college and in high school, not to give yourself to anybody who just approaches and winks at you, but to preserve yourself for God's purpose. 
You know the best thing that's going to happen to you and God is going to give you a lot of love in your life. When you begin to sacrifice financially and you begin to give and at first it may seem like nothing is happening in your life. Promotion is not coming but wait your Sunday morning is coming when the rock is going to be pulled out and supernaturally things will start flooding your life and God is going to do something that you could not do on your own. Because somebody say amen. I met a man and we had him in our church. His name was Jason. He struggled with drugs and he decided to, instead of fight drugs on his own, he decided to admit himself to a rehab center. He went to this rehab center that we are familiar with, very great rehabilitation center. He went there for one year, he had children, but he knew that it's better for him to sacrifice one year to get clean than to spend that one year on drugs and trying to be close to his children. He sacrificed a year with his son so he can be free. During that year, his son developed a disease where they found a hole in his son's heart. After a year of this rehab center, he couldn't wait to leave the rehab to go be with his son who literally, probably is going to die very soon. But during one of those times in prayer, he's, he heard God say, placed on his heart that you need to spend one more year here because you're stable in your freedom but you're not too stable you need to spend one more year imagine his family looked at him and said what an irresponsible father we knew you didn't even deserve to have children look your son has a hole in his heart you finished your one year go back to your family he said no i'm gonna sacrifice one more year and i'm gonna trust that god will take care of my son. My son does not need a drug addict. My son needs a father who is free. And that's exactly what I'm willing to pay a price so my son never sees a dad who drinks, smokes, or uses drugs. He did that. You know, I met other people who didn't do that. I met other people who had children and we told them, please, we'll drive you to the rehab center. You have two children out of wedlock. They deserve a father who is free. And this is what the person told us. No, these children are so precious. Within three months, they took those three children until the end of his life, he will never be able to see them. Why? Because he didn't sacrifice a year to get a lifetime. This brother named Jason after two years came back home <laughs> to his greatest amazement when they went back to the doctor to examine his son they found no hole in his son's heart Amen. today every single day he spends with his son and it's been over probably eight years He's been spending time with his son and honestly, he's going to do that the rest of his life. Why? Because when you sacrifice something, you're going to get much more from God. Amen. And I want to challenge you today. Be a grain who submits itself to the barn and be a grain who submits itself to the sacrifice, whatever God requests so that you can have more of what you sacrifice to God. Because God is faithful and He will meet you at the point of your need. And He will never let what He is originating to die and be buried in a tomb. He will raise it from the dead. Can somebody say amen? You know, we've experienced this this week when we went to uh, Massachusetts some of you know that last year we've decided to with my wife to um, generously uh, give a lot of money toward the cause of people getting saved in a particular country and churches to be opened and i'm not gonna lie to you i had a lot of thoughts you know if i'm gonna take care of this who's gonna take care of me if you're gonna take care of god's kingdom who's gonna take care of your kingdom not that we have a kingdom but who's gonna take care of your kingdom and the interesting part is when we started to give, when we plan to give, I have a rental and I have one unit that is not rented out. Usually in the past six years, it, for me, it was never a problem to rent something out. It took me two, three weeks and usually it would be rented out. And I told the Lord in my heart that if I get to rent, I will start giving. But I knew that's not gonna be faith. And so I made a decision against my own feelings that I'm gonna give and the rent is going to come. So last month, you know, we took a certain amount, it was a large sum of money and we gave. Well, 
the rent didn't come. And for the two months in a row, I did not find tenants. And it was painful because I am looking at my, my thing and I was like, God, I'm not going to make it. This is, this is too hard. This is, this is challenging. My faith is really being stretched. And I sprayed the anointing water in that apartment like crazy. Went all around with it and I was like, the devil is a liar. Any curses, I'm breaking it and everything. But, and I, but I sense this is not the cursing problem that is happening. We went to Massachusetts with my wife and I was very fortunate that they took us, both of us, and they paid for our trip. For us both to go there, they put us in a very nice hotel. Very nice hotel. But I found out that everything that they did, they did from the youth group account. Now, I, we have a youth group and I know youth group accounts. Okay, 300, 400, 500 dollars. That's about good, prosperous youth group account. So I was very surprised how they were able to do that. At the end of the meetings, before we left, we already purposed in our heart that we are going to give this month, even if we don't find rent, we're gonna find money. And not only to that ministry, but something else. And we placed this number in our heart, which we don't have money for. And before we left the airport, um, that youth group account hands us a check. And well, it was a check that blew me out because I have never ever in my life has handled half of what I received on that day in my hand. I looked at my wife and I said, this, this is impossible, this is impossible. Because I wasn't asking God to give me money. I was asking God to give me money so I can pay my seeds. I was like, God, not the prosperity, just give me something so I can still continue to give because I don't have what to give of this month. And literally, we've never had, and I've spoken to youth groups before for seven and eight days in a row or seven, eight sermons and never came close. And I've spoken to some very wealthy churches. And what God did during that weekend and when we came, I told her, first of all, we will never be able to outgive God. And secondly, when we put God's kingdom first, there will, God will take care of us. And the way God will take care of us is going to be better than the way we could ever take care of ourselves. Can somebody say amen? I want to encourage you today. God is going to step into your situation. Do not be afraid to sacrifice. Do not be afraid to yield your life. Do not be afraid to submit because God is going to give you more of what you give to Him every single day in Jesus' name.